Perfect. Let, let's wait um, uh, a minute <clears throat> for people to, to join. Okay, people are coming. Okay, let's wait one more minute. <clears throat> So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, edition of, uh, of Data at Breakfast. <clears throat> uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, <clears throat> and I have the pleasure this morning uh, to introduce uh, to you Dr. Jared Wright. Yeah? Uh, Jared uh, is, a, is, a, uh, is an electrical engineer. Uh, he's a professional registered electrical engineer. He did his PhD uh, at WITS. Um, he's a member of uh, all major uh, international engineering uh, association, and he's currently based uh, at the CSIR in the Energy Center, yeah? <clears throat> where he's involved with um, energy systems operation and planning and, and similar activities. And, um, and at the moment, I think he's also uh, on the com uh, a member of the Commission for the National uh, Planning uh, Commission. Yeah? <clears throat> which was appointed by the, by the presidency. So Jared, we are very happy to have you with us this morning. Uh, and uh, with us on the panel is also the speaker of, of last week, uh, Simon Connell, which gave us uh, last week uh, an interesting account on, uh, on the nuclear energy sector. And, uh, and we are very curious to, to listen to you, Jared, this morning, uh, on your point of view on, on the same set, uh, set of issues. So, Jared, if you would like to start sharing your screen, uh, you're most than welcome to start your, your presentation. Thank you very much. I think you're mute. Ah, you're still muted, uh, uh, Jared. Um, you should unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay, um, so I'm gonna try something a little bit different this morning. Um, I wanna use a tool called Slido for a bit of interactivity. So I'm um, assuming you can see this screen, maybe you can just take a note of it. Um, it's a very easy tool to use. If you just note that number down, um, the 977752, or you can just scan the QR code, pick up your phone and you can scan that QR code. Um, there's a few uh, questions that I'll ask throughout just to get a bit of feedback and background from the audience that's online. So um, I'll sort of hark back to this during the course of the presentation, but um, maybe just before I even start, um, for those of you that have uh, already gone onto that link, um, the QR code is still there on the left. The number is also there. So you go to slido.com and you just type in that code. You can now start to interact. And I see there's one uh, bit of feedback already on this. Um, really what I'd like to talk to this morning is um, least cost energy planning. And particularly in the context of South Africa, least cost energy planning and whether it matters. Um, I see there's some level of an, people that are unsure as well. A lot of people are agreeing, some are not necessarily agreeing. Um, during the course of it, I'm going to, as much as possible, be technology agnostic. It's not necessarily about the technologies, it's about how all of them fit together. Um, it's more about understanding how these cost energy systems can fit together. And as I'll talk through um, some of the slides, you'll see that uh, I'll focus in on electricity uh, in this case, and particularly in South Africa's uh, context the integrated resource plan, of course, understanding that in the medium to long term, that uh, energy is obviously the bigger picture. Um, I'll, I'll also give some reasoning as to why uh, I'll focus in on electricity. So maybe I'll pause the, uh, the poll for now and get into the talk, but I see that in terms of some of the interactions, there's 12 now and most seem to be agreeing that least cost energy planning does matter. Some are unsure, but most are agreeing that it does indeed matter, which is uh, interesting to hear. <clears throat> 
So going into the, uh, the actual presentation, I will um, try and present a few things, but I thought I would just present what is energy planning. And I'm gonna to start to read this paragraph. Actually, no, I'm, I'm not gonna to start to read this paragraph because as you can imagine, that makes absolutely no sense. It's purposefully generated with the scientific paper generator. Um, and the point of this is you can make a topic sound very fancy. You can make it sound very complex. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to be thinking for yourself. Um, you need to be applying some principles, which hopefully I'll try and present today. And obviously as academics, um, and I guess as the wider stakeholder community in the country, um, as well as globally, I suppose, um, you should come to your own conclusions and your own views on the topic. So in terms of what I'll talk through, some background, uh, both globally and in South Africa, a few energy planning principles. I'll then just touch on a few topics on the demand side, a few topics on the supply side, of which then I'll talk uh, about going into the future in South Africa and what we could and should be doing. Just a few thoughts that I'll leave with you towards the end. So in terms of some background, as I said, yes, um, of course, energy is the bigger question, uh, but we'll keep it to electricity for today. <clears throat> the primary reason being that it is indeed the low hanging fruit if we want to take decarbonization seriously um, as a country as well as as world overall. And of course, um, as we increasingly electrify energy and use, electricity also becomes increasingly important. But just for information there, all the way back to 1965 and all the way towards 2019, you can see the different energy carriers. Although there's been quite significant growth in a lot of renewable energy technology beyond that of hydro, um, the interesting part is that they haven't necessarily contributed that significantly yet to the global energy production. Most of it is still dominated by coal, gas, and oil. Um, that is changing over time, but not necessarily as fast as some may hope, perhaps more than fast enough uh, for others. I've just shown on the right hand side there what uh, contribution electricity makes to the global energy mix. So you can see there about 26,000 terawatt hours in 2019. Uh, overall, about 170,000 <coughs> terawatt hours was produced in 2019 on an energy equivalent basis. So it just gives you a picture of where electricity fits into the overall energy mix. So in terms of electricity, um, I've just highlighted a few main technologies here, um, solar PV, wind, nuclear, coal, gas, and hydropower. And as you can see, although coal, gas, and hydro doesn't necessarily run back that far, um, those are really some growth areas, particularly coal and gas. Um, you'll see in the next slides, though, of course, um, most of that is dominated by China. So after a significant ramp up in the 70s and the 80s of nuclear, it's been at around that 400 gigawatt mark in terms of installed capacity. Um, so the PV and wind are on those near exponential growth trajectories and are still growing, uh, interestingly enough. They're still not as big just in terms of installed capacity uh, in that market relative to coal, um, gas, and hydropower. So if we focus in um, from 2000 onwards uh, and we subtract China out, uh, you do start to see some interesting things coming through. Number one, that those two technologies that are growing on that near exponential scale, uh, the one becomes linear, that is wind. The other one remains on that exponential scale. So it shows the world is also adopting that technology. Um, so the PV at that exponential rate, um, wind more at a linear growth rate. Coal is flat, uh, hydropower is slightly growing, while gas has been growing quite significantly since the 2000s. Um, nuclear capacity, at least in terms of installed capacity, has really remained around that 400 gigawatt mark, a small decline down to about 380 to 390 gigawatts um, by the end of 2019. So what does that mean then in terms of electricity production? I've just presented installed capacity for now, um, all the way back to 1990. We've grown uh, at about 1.3 times since 1990 as a globe. Um, most of the growth has been, as I said, in, in, in coal and gas, a lot of renewables growth as well. Um, nuclear has been flat, and especially in the power sector, we're using less and less liquid fuels. Uh, they're noted as oil um, to produce electricity. It's mostly still used in mobility. But as we shift towards more cleaner forms of technology, we really see renewables have been growing, particularly since the 2000s. And that's shown over here um, on an index basis from 1990. Um, the two biggest growth areas is renewables and gas on a relative basis relative to their particular growth levels. Um, coal as well, but not necessarily as much. As I said, nuclear has been flat with a small amount of growth, 1.35 times, and liquid fuels noted there as oil 
has been the one that has declined in terms of its contribution to the electricity sector globally. So coming back to South Africa, we have a promulgated IRP, an integrated resource plan, which is indeed our long-term strategic plan for the country. Um, as noted there, the next best time for an IRP was five to eight years ago because we haven't had one for a very long time, but of course, the next best time is now. So we do have one. We have an updated view as to where our energy mix is going in the country. I'll try and provide a few notes as to what the IRP is saying in the next few slides. For those of you who aren't necessarily as close to it, and those of you who are, perhaps just a summary, it's a summary of what you already know. So the RP 2010-2030 was the previous promulgated document that was promulgated in 2011. There's been various drafts since then, and the RP update in 2013, the draft RP in 2016, as well as 2018, of which a finalized document was gazetted at the end of 2019. Um, the interesting part of this is that although most of the documents in the interim have actually been running in terms of their time horizon to more a long-term trajectory, 2050, um, the more, two most recent versions actually stopped beyond 2030. So the time horizon stops at 2030, and um, so it's a nine-year plan. Um, perhaps some would argue not necessarily a very long-term, ambitious, blue skies type of um, plan that gives us a feel for where the energy mix is going in the long term. As we know, in electricity infrastructure are long lead assets and long lifetime assets, so you do need to have a big time horizon to be looking at 2030 probably um, inadequate in terms of the planning horizon that's needed to inform the types of investments that need to be made. So just to summarize across a few key dimensions, these next two slides do exactly that. Of course, um, these slides will be available and you can um, look at this in your own time. But uh, across the expected energy mix, the demand emissions, as well as options around nuclear and import, there's been various movements. Um, I'll just try and talk through the IRP 2019 for now. The scenario-based approach has been consistent throughout. There hasn't been a shift in that. Um, really big growth areas was uh, in, in coal and variable renewable energy. So coal plays a big role still in 2030, going from about just about 80% today towards 60% by 2030. Variable renewable energy in the form of wind and solar PV um, are significant growth areas to 2030. Um, in terms of uh, a sort of medium role uh, in the mix is, is gas as well as distributed generation or embedded generation, likely dominated by the likes of um, uh, rooftop solar PV. And then in terms of a small relative role, um, nuclear imports, storage, and some other technologies, um, but not uh, zero, that's for sure. Um, they did contribute, and I'll just show that in the next few slides as well in terms of the energy mix. Um, one thing to note, and I'll talk through that later as well, is the demand forecast. It has reduced quite significantly since the RP 2010. Um, you could see that there from the 450 odd terawatt hours that was expected in 2030 down towards uh, between 310 to 300, 310 uh, terawatt hours and then 380 by 2050. Although um, the energy planning doesn't run to that time domain, the demand forecast is provided for that. On emissions, we haven't changed our view as a country on emissions. The peak plateau decline moderate trajectory is what has been assumed. So we peak in, in the mid 2030s in terms of our carbon emissions as a country. We then uh, plateau for a, about a decade towards 2035 or the late 2030s. And then we start declining thereafter at a slow rate towards the end of the time horizon uh, by 2050. In terms of nuclear, there's no new nuclear pre-2030, but there is an indication of including nuclear thereafter. There's been a recent nuclear consultation of the two and a half thousand megawatts that's been proposed uh, to be included. Um, import options are largely hydro, um, possibly gas, but likely dominated by hydro, particularly um, the DRC uh, via Inga, the Inga scheme. In terms of some other components, the coal fleet, new build coal, um, new technologies, as well as security of supply and network needs. I won't run through these in detail, just to say uh, and highlight, particularly on the coal fleet performance, there's been a perpetual, um, I guess, overestimation of what the coal fleet can achieve. Um, in the most recent version of the RP, anywhere between 67 and 76% is the expectation around the energy availability factor, or the EAF. Um, there's also been proposed delays in the minimum emission standards compliance from 2020 towards 2025. Just to give you some information, the latest EAF in 2020 for the ESCOM fleet overall, not the coal fleet, but the fleet overall, was 66%. So it is already under what the RP has been assuming. In terms of energy needs, 
and probably need to be accelerating renewable supply options faster than um, we initially expected. There's new build coal as well in the RP, um, 1.5 gigawatts by 2030, the first 750 megawatts of which is expected to come online by 2023. And there's a lot of new technologies, the variable renewables and their cost and performance has been proven now, although before, at least in the RP 2010, it was not. There was not a lot of confidence as to whether they, um, the costs would come down. As part of the REIPP program, the costs indeed did come down. They started off quite expensive, and one could argue we probably procured too much at those prices. But uh, as part of the latest bid windows, at least bid window for expediting, the costs really did um, uh, drop down to quite competitive numbers. Um, security of supply cost also in our eyes has always assumed the same, and network requirements are established as a base, on a basis of information from um, ESCOM as the network service provider. So this is what the energy mix is expected to look like. It's policy adjusted, it's not least cost, harking back to the title of the presentation. Um, the left-hand side is the installed capacity, the right-hand side is the electricity production. So you can see that coal still plays a large role, around 60%. Um, variable renewable energy technologies, the likes of wind and solar PV, uh, play an increasing role in the order of about 30% by, um, by 2030, while the balance is then filled by uh, nuclear at Kubo as well as um, hydro and imported hydro. Uh, that's Inga, as I was mentioning, that comes online in 2030. Of course, there is a small role that the gas plays. And what I mean by gas is the open cycle gas turbines that are actually still run on diesel. But there is some new investments made in gas in the period from now to 2030 in the order of about 3,000 megawatts. So in terms of some principles, now that you know the background behind um, the, the RP, I just wanted to talk more to how it's done and the least cost of planning approach that's taken. Uh, there's two worlds. The one is the planning world, the, act the one is actual, so the real world. In the planning world, there's a range of inputs that are provided, both in terms of the demand forecast, the existing supply options, the plants that are under construction or preferred bidders. Um, you may have also seen that the risk mitigation program was announced yesterday, and those are preferred bidders now. They have to get to financial close. They need to construct and then um, come online within the next 12 to 18 months. Then we have new supply options. Um, this is all of the technologies, so coal, nuclear, gas, storage, solar PV, wind, hydro, and others, CSP as well. Um, and their technical characteristics and their costs are included. Then there are constraints. Remember, I spoke to, for example, CO2 emissions constraints. Um, so those limits are included. There are constraints in terms of security or adequacy of supply set as a minimum. So you have to make sure that there's a certain level of security of supply across all of the scenarios. That's then pulled into a modeling framework of which South Africa uses a particular commercial um, software package called Flexos, but you could use any long-term capacity expansion planning tool. There are many available, some of which are open source, probably a better way to go in the medium to long-term. Um, that long-term techno-economic optimization is undertaken. And then really to stress test that long-term outcome, uh, medium-term to short-term production cost modeling is done, which includes the unit commitment, the economic dispatch, and how all of those new, uh, existing as well as new supply resources um, fit together in the mix to meet the required demand. So that's the security supply component. So the outputs that you then get from that are um, total system costs. You get a range of other things around CapEx and OpEx over time, the technology mix and the energy share. So that installed capacity in the energy mix I showed you in the previous slide, as well as CO2 emissions and um, water usage. There are other components as well and dimensions that are deemed important. Sometimes this analysis is undertaken in quite, quite a level of detail, for example, on the socioeconomic impacts of shifting the energy mix, the employment opportunities across the technologies. But it's not necessarily as formalized in the RP as yet. So then there's a policy adjustment that's done on the basis of those scenarios. So uh, you get a final promulgated RP, which tells you what should be built and when should we build it and how much of each of those technologies. That's then put into uh, what are called ministerial determinations or the pathways to then um, implement the RP, of which the minister has made determinations around a range of technologies on the basis of the outcome of the RP. There's procurement that's run after that. So this is not typically a competitive bidding process. It could be in the form of feed-in tariffs. It could be in the form of net metering, whichever is the way in which you want to procure or deploy these types of assets that you expect. So this is now the how, almost the market mechanism in the how. The outcomes of which is you get your winning technology. So um, the capacity is allocated, you obtain your preferred bidders, and you have actual costs now that you can then feed back 
And that's why I include that error. So you feed that right back into your inputs when you update the next integrated resource plan. Otherwise, you're just working in a planning world and a simulation world and not in the real world. You need to make sure that those, those numbers, those cost numbers are fed back. A good example of which is the latest outcomes from the Renewable Energy IPP procurement program were then fed back into the RP to make sure that those costs were deemed accurate. Similarly, if we and when we do procure coal or nuclear or gas, those actual costs should be fed back into the next iteration of the integrated resource plan to establish an updated view as to what the new outcomes should be looking like. And uh, most definitely, we should be updating the RP on a periodic basis to make sure that we are making the right types of decisions as these costs start to shift over time. And that's what I was talking to you um, in the previous slide, but I'll just summarize it here quickly, where we take a range of planning facts as energy planners, we pull it into a least cost-based case, we then establish a range of scenarios around that where you start to stress test different questions. Um, should there be limits on particular technologies that just include variable renewables there, and which is in the RP at the moment? Should there be forcing of certain technologies on the basis of industrialization or particular um, competitive advantages we may have as a country? Um, for example, CSP or coal or nuclear. And um, should we be asking, should we be advancing a CO2 decline a lot faster as South Africa or not? Um, test those kinds of scenarios. You then have an ability to compare on a, on, the, on, the, on a relative base case, at least cost, to all of these other scenarios, of which on the basis of those additional costs across the different scenarios, you undertake typically you undertake your public consultation. The DMRE did that as part of the RP. Um, you do your policy adjustments of the base case on the basis of that public consultation and establish the final RP for approval and gazetting. Um, I just wanted to leave a few notes here on the modeling framework, um, just to give everyone comfort that the tool is you, the tool that is used needs to be and needs to capture. It needs to be world class, but it needs to capture all of these kinds of cost drivers. Um, it co needs to co-optimize long-term investment as well as the short-term decisions you need to make. So what to build and when to build and how to operate it with the objective function being least cost. Um, you need to ensure that you include all of the technical characteristics of existing as well as new build plants. So how fast they can ramp up and down, um, how much you can switch them on and off, the minimum stable levels. But most importantly on the right-hand side there is really to ensure that you include the primary cost drivers of the power generators. So the capex, the OPEX, the fuel, um, the efficiency of each of the plants, making sure that you characterize the fact that they can or can't provide particular types of reserves. And you also capture their start and shutdown costs if there are any of those, particularly for coal, it's important, which means it's important for South Africa as coal does dominate our energy mix at the moment and still will for some time. Um, but the costs that are not uh, in the RP, what are those? Uh, these are often raised as concerns, uh, network costs. So from, uh, whether it's a shallow or deep net, net, network connection costs, um, in the RP at the moment, the shallow costs are included, but not the deep network connection costs. And what I mean by deep network connection costs are those that are established by, by ESCOM as the network operator, the transmission network operator, as part of their transmission development plan. So as a function of the different scenarios and different technologies that are rolled out, so a large coal scenario, a large gas scenario, a large nuclear or renewable scenario or gas, uh, um, uh, other technologies, um, what does the network cost, the deep network cost look like and how does that change across the different scenarios? So it's all a relative comparison and I'll show that in the next few slides as well. And then the system services that aren't included, um, reserves are included of course, but others that are not are the likes of system stability, frequency stability, transient stability, the need to black starts, if you do need to black starts, reactor power and fault levels. And um, the key question being of course, and that's what I'll show in the next slide is how important are these costs? And then other costs, so metering, billing, customer services, but these are very, very small and I'll show that in the next slide as well. So this is essentially what it looks like. You optimize the dominant cost drivers, that dark blue area there, and you don't optimize the others, but you take those as inputs into the energy planning um, that you undertake. So the transmission, distribution, network costs, system services and other. Typically, globally, we've seen, as well as actually in South Africa, those are in the order of about 15 to 20% of the total system costs. So the important part now, and this is just something I wanted to demonstrate is between two different scenarios, I'm not putting numbers here, I'm not putting technologies here on purpose. Um, a base case, a lease cost, where you have a generation component that is optimized as part of the RFP, um, being let's say 0.8, 0 
And then another scenario where that's generation costs are higher because you intentionally made a policy adjustment, you chose other technologies that are perhaps more expensive and therefore it costs one instead of 0.8. The different components that then feed into the base case in terms of those that are not optimized in the RP are then in the light blue there. And let's assume that they are quite high um, in the order of, it's just the number there, 30%, it's 31 actually in terms of the numbers and you get to a total system cost. You then look on the right-hand side at that scenario, scenario one, whatever that may be, and it actually has cheaper costs in terms of the transmission, in terms of the distribution, as well as other system services that are needed. You add a, a slightly less amount. Now, the important comparison is the cost differential of that total system cost between the two, of which you can see just as an example, the base case, by definition, it is least cost, still comes out cheaper than that scenario one. So that's why I was asking and, and, and really putting into your mind the question of how important are those other cost drivers, how big are they, and therefore can you still be confident that, for example, a least cost outcome is then, uh, let's say, robust uh, against those other costs that you did not include, those other costs that you did not deem as, as dominant and you did not include in your energy planning approach. So going into some energy planning 101 before we go into the supply and the demand side, um, typically what energy planners do is they take the demand profile and they uh, order it from highest to lowest into what's called their load duration curve. Um, they would then optimize on that basis into the future based on the demand forecast uh, for each and every year, if it's 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 years or more in the energy planning horizon, as to what supply technologies need to meet this demand requirement. So you would see um, for 6,000 hours plus of the year, you would have a base demand need. So that's sort of highlighted in that brown area there. You then have what's typically called a mid-merit need, which is any between, anywhere between 1,000 and 6,000 hours of the year. So that's that sort of gray area there. And then that sort of peach cream area at the top is what's typically called your peak demand requirements. Um, so this is a demand curve, this is not a supply curve. But in the past, in terms of energy planning and how that's been done, you would typically then have technologies that are on the supply side that would meet your base demand needs. So you have base supply, you have mid-merit supply, and you have peak in supply technologies that meet those needs. You can see that the quantities of each of these are, are defined there. It's just a representative example, but keep those in mind as we run through the next few slides. So we take that load duration curve on the left-hand side, which now is just dotted, same graphic, um, same numbers, same peak demand, mid-merit, as well as base demand requirements for the year. But as you deploy variable renewable energy, um, the energy costs for them, the rand per kilowatt hours, uh, so the energy pr provision from them is relatively cheap. So that is starting to happen quite significantly a lot of, in a lot of energy planning models. Um, you really start to um, drive down that what's called a residual demand curve, which is essentially your demand, less the variable renewable energy production, and you get to a new curve. That's the red curve on the right-hand side. What that does is it totally shifts the share between how much base supply do you need to meet the re residual base demand how much mid-merit do you need to meet that residual mid-merit demand? And how much peaking do you need to meet the peaking uh, demand requirements? And you can see that it starts to shift to more of a peaking type of need. And um, so you see that sort of cream sliver is a lot thicker now. You have slightly less mid-merit needs, but you have notably less base supply needs to meet your, your, your residual demand. You need increasing levels as a result of this, as I'll show in the next few slides, you need increasing levels of flexible supply technologies, technically as well as economically um, flexible, to meet your residual demand needs into the future. Assuming that you're going down this course of deploying more and more variable renewable energy, which as I showed in the previous slides is what the RP is indeed doing. So what that means then in terms of the supply mix on the left-hand side, uh, as well as the energy mix on the right-hand side, is that you have that significantly less base supply. You have a similar amount of mid-merit um, a lot less, um, uh, um, I mean, a lot more uh, peaking needs and obviously a lot of capacity in terms of the variable renewable energy. But when you look at the contribution in the mix, the, the supply mix on the right-hand side, you see that the actual energy you get from that peaking capacity is quite small. You similarly also see that the actual energy that you get from the mid merits is quite small, a lot smaller than the future without a variable renewable energy component of the mix. And you then see that obviously in this case, it's 15% of the mix, just as an example, coming from variable renewable energy. You need less and less um, base supply to then meet the, the residual demand requirements. 
So now what energy planners started to find was, well, as you introduce these technologies that are quite variable in nature, um, yeah, the sun isn't always there, the wind doesn't always blow. Um, this, is, this is obvious. There are modeling, uh, there are ways in which forecasts can obviously um, ameliorate that from a system operations perspective, but just to show you what it means on the temporal scale, this is just an example month. Um, I intentionally can't show an entire year, it wouldn't necessarily be very useful. You wouldn't really, really be able to see the um, concepts that I'm trying to demonstrate. The dotted curve at the top is the demand requirement. Um, goes up during the day, low on the weekends, you have that typical evening peak and morning um, increase in demand. As you deploy, for example, now in South Africa in the early 2020s, we'll have about 10% of our energy mix coming from variable renewable energy, solar PV and wind. So that's what that is doing there, is it then pushes down on the demand. You have a residual demand curve, which is highlighted there in the red. So what that means is that your base demand, or your gross, let's call it, um, is, is shown there uh, in, the, in the black. But then in the red is the residual base demand, and it starts to push it down only slightly. So you don't need much additional flexibility quite yet. Your complementary existing fleet could likely meet it, which it is doing, the coal fleet at the moment. And we, I've just noted at the bottom there as to how the base demand, mid merit, as well as peaking demand, whether it's the system or the residual, is changing. And um, so you see in terms of the system, quite a lot of base, um, medium amount of mid merit type capacity needed. So those in South Africa would be our more expensive base load stations. Um, and quite a little, small amount of, of peaking needs. On the residual, still quite similar. It's changing, but not changing that much quite yet. As part of the RP though, we'll get towards 20% by the mid 2020s, perhaps a little bit later. Um, and you can increasingly see that the residual base demand is being pushed down and that curve is becoming more and more peaky. You have more and more ramping needs during the day as you deploy more on solar PV and wind. So what that means then, if we look at the, at the, the graphic on the bottom right, is that you have a less and less need for base demand. You have a similar amount of mid merit, but a lot more peaking needs. So what this means is that your flexibility needs are increasing. Your existing fleet can't necessarily meet that, so it's becoming binding. And you do need to start to deploy some complementary technologies to meet those increasing flexibility needs. It could be in the form of um, gas-fired or liquid fuel um, OCGTs or engines. It could be in the form of short duration storage or perhaps even long duration storage as well. Um, when you then go towards more 30% of the energy mix, this is by 2030, um, you see you have a significant reduction in the residual on the base demand side, and therefore you have less and less need for the base supply technologies, an increasing need for mid mirror technologies and a significant growth in the peaking type technologies. So CapEx light, although a lot of the time could be quite um, OPEX expensive on the fuel side, so it would be diesel or gas, or, or actually it could also be CSP, by the way, if, it's, if the technology and the economics work in the future. Um, by the way, this doesn't necessarily mean that the existing fleet that is there is not able to be flexible. This includes nuclear, this includes coal. And if it's retrofitted to do this and is able to meet these variable needs of the residual demand, then they should do exactly that. Um, it's all about the economics and whether it is more economical to do that versus invest in new supply options. So going to the demand side and then on the supply side, um, just on the demand side, I'll present some historical perspective as to GDP growth, uh, as well as then the expectations into the future. This isn't updated to the latest version of the IRP, and not a lot of the information unfortunately was provided, but um, the important component here is that there is an expectation for the GDP to grow quite significantly in the order of two to 4%. And um, of course it settles and saturates over time. But as you can see from historical experience, it has been up and down and uh, perhaps has been significantly lower, which is why we've seen flat to declining demand, electricity demand in the country. So the question that is always asked then is, although the RP 2010, which I'm showing there in that sort of thin line, um, expected quite significant demand growth, we have not seen that. And then similarly, even in the RP 2016, and by the way, the RP 2018 and, and RP 2019 use very similar demand forecasts, just adjusted for future years. So adjust it down slightly. Um, will we be seeing these kinds of growth levels or will we, will we be seeing a, a flat demand forecast or much lower levels, for example, the red curve as opposed to the black curve, where the black curve, which is the higher demand forecast is about 1.4 times the red curve by 2050. There's also some information that's come out from the EIUG where they've published a demand forecast and they are of the view that they're a bit more bearish about where the demand is going. Um, still growing, but not necessarily growing as much as what the RP is expecting. 
The real question though that we need to ask is whether the demand forecast is high, whether the demand forecast is low, how much does it matter? And what I mean by this is we have an existing fleet that is planned to be decommissioned at their dead stop dates. Um, that is predominantly the coal fleet at their 50 year life. And as a result of that, whether the demand grows or not, you have an increasing gap that needs to be met with new build supply technologies. So all that the demand forecast does is it determines the timing and the scale. It doesn't determine whether we should or should not build new technologies. We do need new supply. We need to be growing the economy. We are still and probably still, should still remain quite energy intensive for some time. Um, there is existing plans for continued industrialization. And we do not want to be deindustrializing too soon and moving more towards the secondary and tertiary um, components of our economy too fast. So just to talk to two components on the demand side in terms of demand side flexibility, there's some interesting concepts coming out. Um, this isn't necessarily in the integrated resource plan or in a lot of energy planning. It's more um, in, I would say now, I guess, academic context in South Africa. But globally, uh, countries, utilities are thinking about this very carefully. And that is using the demand side to flexibly move demand around um, and paying for that. So for example, um, in South Africa, we have a significant amounts of our warm water heating uh, electrified. And by 2030, we'll probably have about 22 million households 11.2 million electric water heaters. And if we have about 25% that are controllable, we'll have the ability to shift about five terawatts per year, 5.4 terawatts per year, or just about 14, uh, 15 gigawatts, gigawatt hours per day. So you can really move the demand up and down during the day. It's a storage mechanism essentially for the power system to then deal with any variability that you may have on the supply side. As you will have seen, variable renewables are coming online, so that's expected to happen. But we've also seen a lot of variability on the supply side as the coal fleet has been um, failing over, over, over quite a few years for some time now, unfortunately. Um, electric vehicles, although in South Africa, this is probably going to be a lot slower than most expect. If we just say that there's about 11 million private vehicles in South Africa today, and we have about a million by 2030, perhaps even half of that, um, and you have 25% that are able to be used in what's called um, grid to vehicle mode, where the, when the vehicles are plugged in, they actually operate as essentially a large fleet of, of battery storage. Um, we have about also five terawatt hours per day, about 14 gigawatt hours per day, with a very different profile, and this needs to be considered in the energy planning, but you now have the ability to shift the demand side um, up by 4.4 gigawatts and down by 0.6 gigawatts, uh, depending on when you need it as a system operator. So essentially acting as a large battery. Uh, that you don't necessarily invest in directly, that you pay as part of an ancillary service provided to the grid as a result of that. So on the supply side, um, I'm going to pause here and go back to Slido. Um, so if you open up your phones and just have a look at your phones and answer one or two questions, that would be great. I'm going to jump across to that. But the question I wanted to ask is across these four key dimensions, cost, um, environment, system, and the economy or economic or socioeconomic impacts. There are four technologies that are listed here. I've purposefully not put the names in, but I'd like to just ask you, what do you think is technology one? So I'll stop this poll and just start the next one. So, uh, sorry, before I go into that, actually, yes. Um, choose your two favorite technologies first, and then we'll go into those uh, questions. I'll leave it for about a minute and we can go through that. You can see that the uh, QR code is there on the left still. Um, the slido.com uh, survey number is also there, 977752. And perhaps if you just provide a few inputs here, I'll wait 30 seconds. I see that solar PV, wind, coal, nuclear, gas actually, nuclear is up there. Solar PV seems to be the favorite of most, it seems. Wind. Interesting that no one has, doesn't have a favorite. Okay, so it seems like there's some consistent outcomes here. Solar PV, wind, uh, nuclear, gas, but solar PV seems to be quite far ahead of most. Okay, interesting. Um, we'll leave it at that. Um, thanks for that engagement. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you here, what is technology one? Now, I'm going to skip back to the presentation just so you can see uh, the characteristics of technology one. So here's the slides here. Um, 
you can see technology one and its characteristics in terms of resource, investment costs, running costs, fuel, lifetime, uh, its impact on the environment, so emissions, the water use, its environmental impact, whether it is flexible from a system perspective, whether it's dispatchable from a system perspective, can it provide system services? Um, is it localizable for the country, for South Africa? Um, and what, are, what is its job creation potential or employment opportunities? So I'll leave this here for a few seconds. Of course, I've started the poll already. Um, I'll jump back there to just show you some of the outcomes, but I'll leave it here for a few more seconds and um, just so you can read through it and familiarize yourself with it. Of course, keeping in mind that very favorable is a filled um, circle, unfavorable is then a more empty circle. So most are saying that technology one is solar PV. Large components are saying that it's nuclear. And it's smaller for gas, and I'm not saying that it's coal. More saying that it's nuclear. So jumping back here, um, I think we've got a set all the answers. Solar PV and nuclear at the top, gas, no, coal, none. Okay. If, uh, if I jump back here and, and just do one more, uh, we'll go to technology four. And I'll show you the screen again, but maybe you could just choose what you think is technology four. So very good in terms of resource volume or the renewable nature of it. And um, its running costs are very low. Investment costs are fine, they're okay, not great. It's got very good performance on fuel costs as well as LCOE, pretty much no emissions and very low water usage. Its environmental impact is good. It's not very flexible, it's not very dispatchable. It provides some level of system services. It's quite localizable um, and it's okay, but not great in terms of job creation potential. <laughs> I seem to say it's solar PV again. <laughs> I'll wait a few more seconds and then continue. It's coming back to the responses here. Okay, so it seems like most think this is also so um, but there's some coal and nuclear here. Interesting. So I'll, I'll um, stop the, the poll now. Uh, but thank you for that interactive level of interaction. Uh, going to this next slide now, you'll see that the first technology was coal. Um, the last technology was solar PV. So you're right on the second one in terms of the grouping, but not necessarily on the first one. Um, coal has very long lifetime. It has, relatively speaking, good resource longevity and volume, but not great. Um, it's uh, fuel costs are not great, but it's LCOE is okay. It's not good on emissions. It's not good on water use and environmental impact. It's not very flexible, but very dispatchable and can provide system services. And as you've seen in South Africa, it's quite localizable and can create jobs. Um, solar PV as technology four is renewable in its nature. Its running costs are extremely low. Fuel costs are very low as well, so it performs very well there. Um, the emissions are obviously zero, or not zero, but, but near zero. There are embedded emissions, of course, but quite, quite low. Um, water use, very good. Um, its localization of uh, potential is good, and its job, job, job creation is okay, not the best, but okay. So uh, the point of this is I, wouldn't, I wasn't trying to, to prove a point as to which technologies are better than the other, but it's all about the mix. And it's about the cost and the value that each of these technologies provide, both in terms of the direct costs in the power system when you do your least cost energy planning, as well as the other costs that you may be not necessarily internalizing into the planning that you're doing. So if it is localization of job creation, for example, or if you're not costing um, the cost of emissions, for example, 
or if you're not costing in the need for flexibility or dispatchability, of which, of course, as I was mentioning earlier, most of these characteristics are included in the integrated resource plan methodology applied um, in South Africa and in most other jurisdictions. So here's all of the others, by the way, just for your interest. And of course, you can have a look at these in your own time, but I've also included wind, biomass, hydro, as well as storage. It's not a primary energy option, of course, storage, and it just shifts energy around, it's recycled energy, but it definitely has a role to play and can play a role in future power systems. So going into the future, um, my last two slides, and then I will stop. Um, just to note eight key items. Uh, I think particularly the components of cost that we can't include or don't include explicitly in the integrated resource plan, either because of, um, I guess they're not deemed as important or um, they're just not included as part of the methodology as it stands and perhaps it should change. Um, we need to be using our capabilities. We need to build more of those capabilities and we need to be collaborating. So cost those networks. Um, ESCOM have extensive experience in doing this and planning the networks and their transmission development plan actually does do this, but it isn't directly linked to the integrated resource plan. So we should use it and complement it with available academic and industrial partners to assist ESCOM in doing this a bit better. Um, perhaps thinking of ways in which it can be directly integrated into the integrated resource plan. That is the TDP, the transmission development plan. Um, the system operator is the expert um, and they understand system services and, and the energy, the, the system services that are needed. So let's cost them. Those costs that aren't in the RP and um, those ancillary services, the fault levels, the, the need for um, good fault levels to ensure stability, to ensure voltage control as well. So reactive power needs, black start, frequency control, the ability to control the frequency is critically important. Um, we need to then, when relevant as well, do the detailed design and the costing of them. So if we deem that they are sufficiently large, then we need to make sure that they are included across the various scenarios that are undertaken as part of the integrated resource plan. Um, and although I've say, said it a few times, we need to be quantifying costs and relative costs across scenarios. And um, this positions policy on the basis of transparency as well. It buys trust and it ensures that most stakeholders then are brought along with the process and not just necessarily told at the end. And I'll get to that in the next slide as well. And I've mentioned it once or twice, but periodic and systems updating with transparent gov governance is critical as part of the, this policy making process. We do apply a very centralized energy planning approach in South Africa. And it's not necessarily as market driven as some other jurisdictions. So updating the RP periodically and consistently, it is administrative in its nature, is critical to ensure that we're making some of the best decisions we can be making on the technology choices that we make as a country going forward. Um, perhaps there's some, some changes that could be made in governance structures, so reporting, subcommittees and public engagements, how those are done. There are some good examples globally on this and uh, some good best practice, I would say, that could be utilized as part of it. So in terms of some other uh, more general comments to finalize on, um, of course, all models uh, are, are wrong. Um, some are just more useful than others. They do have limitations, but indeed, that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't provide insights. Um, we probably should not be trying to be too prescriptive with the integrated resource plan. We should probably be more around the types of technology choices we make in the medium, te te uh, medium term. And those technology choices should then be more generalized as to a direction that we're going in, as opposed to trying to say to the nth decimal point as to how much of each technology should be deployed in every year. Um, of course, I think our energy research and our planning needs to catch up. We need bigger communities of practice. Um, we need to be doing a lot more in terms of transparency, probably moving more towards open software and open tools. Um, black boxes are not good to buy public trust. I think we've seen that in a lot of other domains and I think energy planning shouldn't necessarily be any different. Um, I think we need to be a bazaar, not the cathedral. Um, what I mean by that is that typically in a cathedral, um, the building is done and then the outcome is seen at the end. Um, in open code development and in open software, you uh, act like a bazaar and the source is developed together with everyone. Everyone sees what's being, being built. Everyone sees the food that's being made or the ways that are being sold. And that's in view of the public at all times. So implicitly, you're buying trust continually and perpetually throughout the process, as opposed to starting and stopping periodically as to what information is out there and when it's out there for everyone else to see. That also helps, of course, on my final point here is to eliminate errors, to buy that trust. So enough oversight and you have more eyes on the prize means you'll make less mistakes. So it's very unlikely that any input assumptions or approaches or the outcomes will have errors in them. There will always be discussions 
and robust debates as to the methodologies applied, as to the input assumptions that are being used, particularly on the basis of technology lobbying. But that is exactly part of the discussion. It eliminates errors and ensures that you get to a consensus on those input assumptions and hopefully then as well on the outcomes as a result. So I will stop there for now. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, I think I'm still within time and we have a few minutes left. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, Jared, thank you very much for a fantastic and uh, incredibly in informative uh, uh, and entertaining talk. The, the, the pulse was, 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 was really nice and uh, with some surprising <laughs> outcomes. Thank you very much. It was really very nice. Um, while we give uh, maybe our audience uh, a minute to think about questions, uh, let me start by asking our two other panelists and the speaker of last week if they would like to uh, to make some comment or, 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 or remark. Simon, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I think just a few very simple points about modeling. Um, it hasn't really been correct anywhere. And I want to use the case of Germany. Its electricity price has increased. It's currently three times the South African price. And they have gone a much larger fraction of renewables. We can also look at Australia. We can also look at California. And so I think it points to something not being taken account properly in the modeling. Where exactly is this error? So. Part of the things I think is this lifetime. I, I mean, just having an RP that uh, looks in the future to nine years, for me, it's part of the problem. You know, I was trying to emphasize that the lifetime of, of nuclear could be 40, 60, 80 years. Then what is then the lifetime of renewable energy? The estimates I see are down at 25 years. What is really the cost of variability? At the moment, we heard you can swallow the cost of <clears throat> variability in the existing base load doing, take, taking up that slack. But as the penetration increases, you have to do something else. And, and we've heard that, you, you know, open cycle gas turbines and so on could be there. So if you needed that, you'd also need the pipelines to take the gas. You'd also need the storage facilities. You, you can't simply say it's just the cost of an open cycle gas turbine. So there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure that's needed. Also, renewables use the grid much more than baseload. So you would have to reapportion the costs, um, which are, are not taken into account at the moment. There's a disproportionate reliance on that infrastructure from some modalities than the other. So I think the models actually need to take more into account, have longer timescales. Otherwise, how do we explain that right now nuclear is 40 cents a kilowatt hour some say 20, some say 45 cents a kilowatt hour. And, and um, in countries that have done the large penetration renewable experiments much more. So that's just, I, I like modeling, okay? I'm a computational physicist myself, but I'm just saying we need to really ask where is the error in these models? Would you like to sure. respond uh, to that question? Or questions? Okay. Or do you want other uh, questions? No, 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 please. If you want to, re to reply to, to, to Simon's comment, you're most than welcome, Jared. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, to be, to, to, to be completely frank, I'm not here to defend particular technologies or take sides on technologies. That's not what I do. I'm an energy planner. Um, I'll take all of the technologies into the mix. I have no interest in particular outcomes. So the juxtaposition between nuclear and renewables, I, I couldn't care less, to be completely honest. Um, it's more about how these technologies fit into the mix and the modeling that sits behind it to make sure that the best fidelity models to meet the needs of the outcome, which is 
cost and are you representing the costs accurately? Um, I'll, I'll go into the, the, the discussion around how other countries have gone down the renewables road, but on lifetime, um, I, I'll try and explain um, more, more generally, but the, the lifetime of the assets uh, are 100% incorporated into an RP type methodology and into the energy modeling that's, that's, that's undertaken. So if you have a technology that has a two year lifetime, it will need to be rebuilt every two years. If you have a technology that has a 20 or 30 year lifetime, it has to be rebuilt every 20 or 30 years. And those costs have to be incurred. So you have to rebuild that asset in 20 years time or in 30 years time. Similarly, on the nuclear side that you're talking to, 40, 60 or 80 years, you have to then rebuild that technology after 40 or 60 or 80 years. Um, as you can imagine though, uh, into the future when you apply discounting, those costs start to fall away. Um, so yes, you need to rebuild an asset after 20 years, for example, for a solar PV at a wind plant. You need to be rebuilding an asset after 25 years for a solar PV plant. You need to rebuild an asset like a coal power plant or a nuclear power plant after 50 years. Those costs are all included. But as you go further into the future, those costs are discounted quite significantly as a result of the discount rate that you apply and the discounted cash flow analysis that incorporates the overall optimization. You're optimizing across all of the years, discounting into the future, taking that entire number across all the options and all of the technologies and minimizing cost on that basis. So the lifetime is 100% included, always has been and has to be actually, and always should be um, included. In, in, in terms of the um, infrastructure investments on, uh, I think you mentioned OCGTs and, and fuel, those are also 100% included in the methodology, both in terms of the investment cost, so the rand per kilowatt on the investment side of the, of the OCGT or engines or whatever it may be, as well as the equivalent fuel cost that you will see. So yes, you, if you're going to do gas, for example, in specifically in South Africa, you likely need to be building LNG import infrastructure, whether that's in the form of FSRUs or actual permanent on land based infrastructure, pipelines as well. And what that means is you need certain volumes to make it work. If it's not going to work, you need a lookup table almost. You need a price versus volumes lookup table. So if you're gonna take less volume, it's going to cost more per gigajoule of fuel that you take because you're investing in the same amount of infrastructure for less fuel that you're taking off. The fuel, of course, is the variable components, the infrastructure being the fixed component. Um, at the moment, at least in South Africa's RP, that assumes quite a heavy um, penalty on the fuels uh, in the order of um, 10 to $12 per gigajoule on the natural gas. Uh, for interest sake, by the way, as part of the risk mitigation program, which is going to be a component of LNG, the LNG looks to be coming in at about those prices, actually a little bit cheaper. So it seems like the RP costs are holding uh, relative to some real world actual um, implementation that is hopefully going to be happening in the next 12 to 18 months. So those are 100% included in the methodology as well. Um, the, the discussion on, on, on nuclear being 40 to 45 cents per kilowatt hour, there's a very key differentiation here. And this is exactly why in the RP, Kuberg never decommissions earlier than 2044. Kuberg is very cheap as a nuclear um, technology. And Kuberg is, uh, yes, in the order of probably 40 to 45 cents per kilowatt hour. I think it's actually a bit cheaper than that, probably 30 to 35 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, that is an existing technology should not be decommissioning that. It's providing you with clean energy and you should be using it. Um, the real discussion here is meeting marginal demand, new build technologies. You are not going to be building a new build nuclear power station at 40 cents per kilowatt hour. That hasn't been seen globally anywhere and probably won't ever be seen. It's more in the order of higher LCOEs, but it's really important as to the capex cost of that. China is building it at about three to three and a half thousand dollars per kilowatt. Um, in the West, it's more in the order of four to five or even higher. In the integrated resource plan, the assumption is four and a half thousand dollars per kilowatt in terms of the installation, which then ends up at about 130 to 150 per kilowatt hour on an LCOE basis. Again, the RP methodology does not use LCOE. The RP methodology takes in all of these fundamental cost drivers, the CapEx, the fuel, the o &M, fixed as well as variable. In, in, in terms of the um, question on, on Germany and their energy prices, I would tend to agree with you. They adopted very early. Um, their prices then went up as a result of that, particularly on solar PV. I'm actually not sure as to why Germany invested so much in solar PV. They don't have a very good solar resource. South Africa does. Um, but from about the 2000s up to 2014, they were deploying a lot of solar PV. They were deploying it at very expensive rand per kilowatt installed. Um, they started to import that technology though from China. This was their industrial policy. They 
thought that we should have localized a lot of that, but they did not. And since 2014, 15, 16 and onwards, you've actually seen a flattening in the energy prices. So yes, they deployed early. They probably learned for the rest of the world and their tariffs went up as a result. That was the industrial policy decision that they made uh, to do that. And it was a part of what they call the energy vendor. Um, what's important though, is that they got those costs down. And since then, the costs have been quite cheap for those types of technologies on a rent per kilowatt hour basis. And you'll see that, um, I just actually pulled up a graph here, but I want to show my screen, it's not important, that the increases have largely been flat since about 2014, 2015. The absolute numbers are high because they have those PPAs for locked in for 20 years. Um, and they probably should not have done as much as they had done. Similarly, they've been shutting down their nuclear fleet and have had to, as a result, build some coal. Um, that was also, again, a, a policy choice that they made as a country. But I think the important component here is that it's not because they are deploying more and more variable renewables now that their tariffs are high. It's because they've deployed those variable renewables at a time where the costs for them were quite high. At the moment, they've come down quite significantly in the order of two to three times cheaper than what they were in the 2000s when they initially deployed them. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Jared, for that extensive uh, uh, and clarifying uh, reply. There is an interesting question uh, in, in the chat, uh, and, and maybe more than a question, is probably a, a request for advice. And it is by uh, Winston Ponsami, who works in the Institutional Planning Department of UKZ10. Yeah? And he's playing with the idea of, um, <clears throat> of setting up uh, uh, a diesel-based uh, generation of electricity for, for the campus needs. Yeah? Uh, do you have any advice for him? Um, yeah, it, I'll, I'd be able to take the discussion offline if you'd like, because I have a lot. <laughs> and what I mean by I is CSR. Um, CSR has done a lot of our own self-supply um, in recent times, both for research purposes as well as in terms of cost saving. Um, interestingly enough, CSR is deemed a national key point, so we're not exposed to load shedding, but we are doing our planning on the basis that we will be. So similarly, we want to retrofit our existing backup diesel generators to be able to run at particular times to offset where the tariffs are heading, so for cost saving, but also to offset and essentially act as if we are being load shed and, and, and act as in a research environment that we make sure that we are considered as just a normal consumer of electricity. Actually, as part of most of our deployments, it's also been in solar PV. Um, we've intentionally done pure access and single access tracking. We've also done rooftop solar PV. And we've seen quite substantial savings um, for, for ourselves and our electricity bills. But without going into the details, I'm happy to have that discussion offline. Yeah. Okay, then uh, with your permission, Jared, I will uh, share your email address with, with Winston and <laughs> you can uh, start a discussion uh, offline. Yeah. Um, I don't know, uh, Simon and Ilya, are there other questions that um, we would like to address before we slowly come to an end? <clears throat> Uh, there are a few questions in Q and A, and I can read them. Please, Ilya. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. So probably there is one question about uh, or a statement that uh, there is an issue with the models, and for example, the global warming and COVID nineteen show us the kind of the weakness of the modeling. But I think you address it in in your comment to the uh, Sim Simon's uh, question. So and. Uh, the next question is of concern is localization of raw material for wind and solar and possibility uh, for being monopolized or leveraged. I'm not sure how to interpret them or is the interpret is it kind of related to the previous question? But maybe you can tell something about you know the monopoly approach or kind of the ownership approach for these resources. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that applies for any um, future that we go down and the raw materials needed to, to make choices around energy that we need to make. Um, particularly in South Africa, as we seem to be transitioning. Um, I think as, as part of that, and I think there's a big discussion out there around a just transition, but it's a bit more general. More specifically, it's very likely that South Africa is going to go down a minerals to minerals transition, where we just shift the types of minerals that we use. I agree that there's uh, something that needs to be addressed um, in not just in South Africa, but globally as to resources and resource beneficiation and the ownership thereof, uh, as well as the 
discussion around whether it should be public or private. Um, that's always a more of an ideolo ideological and political type discussion, of course, but um, that's something that is very context specific and very specific to the cultures of the different countries that it's applicable to. And of course, each country has their sovereign right to make the decisions that they make. Um, I won't say much more than that for now, just to say that it's definitely something that needs to be um, assessed more closely, something that is not an issue that can just be brushed away. Um, any choice that we make and any technology choices that we make, uh, whether it's South Africa or the world, we need to uh, deal with those um, head on. We, we, we can't walk away from that. Thank you. Okay, okay. But I think the, you also answered in principle the other comment or question, which is saying that in costing, other differences in correct decommissioning and long term management costs are also being taken into account. In, nuclear vs solar, I think you also addressed that. I don't know if you want to comment that once more. Yeah, maybe, maybe just to say um, across all technologies, there's waste across all technologies that needs to be managed, whether it's by recycling or long-term storage and management of waste, um, whether it's nuclear or solar or wind or coal, um, there's different time frames, there's different costings, and there's various views that you can get on that. Um, in the RP at the moment in South Africa, just to bring it closer to home, those are not included. So on a relative basis, all the scenarios are compared equally. But of course, if we look at the longer term, those long-term management costs, those long-term waste management costs would need to be incurred at a, a, a quite a significant future date and therefore significant discounting. It doesn't necessarily mean you discount it away and it's not important because we need to think about future generations as well. But from an economics perspective, it is discounted often. And perhaps that is why it's not necessarily always deemed as important. Um, I'm not saying personally that it's not as important, but that's probably why it's not necessarily considered as important and typically kicked down the road as to something that can be dealt with at a later stage. Yeah, thank you very much, Jared. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious about the time because one of the rules of our data breakfast is that it should last an hour because people have, uh, after listening to the talks, have to have to go to, to work, <laughs> at least most of them, most of us. Yeah. So Jared, thank you so much for the really informative uh, talk that uh, really helped, uh, helped us understand much better what is going on behind, behind the scenes. Yeah. So thank you very much for, for your time and for sharing your, your, your knowledge with us. And I'm very glad that uh, we also established possible new collaborations <laughs> between UKZ10 and, and the CSIR. I would also like to thank uh, Simon for, for, uh, for being with us again this morning. Uh, and Thomas, who facilitated uh, for Jared to, uh, to speak at the Data Breakfast this morning. And of course, Ilya, who is our standard uh, uh, co-host. Thank you very much, Ilya, for, for always being with us. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I hope you will be able to have a coffee now if, if you have electricity or, or made arrangement prior to the talk to, 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 to save some in a thermos flask. So all the best to, to everyone. Have a good weekend. And we will see you in the same uh, spot in Zoom next, next week Friday. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Jared. Thank you so much.